Hi, I'm Art Bergeron, and the presentation you're about to see is the one that I had pre-recorded for showing uh, in Hudson in October. This is all about planning for the kids and the grandkids. This is what you thought estate planning was all about, making sure that when you're dead, uh, your asset, or while you're alive, your assets go to the right people. Uh, so we're talking about, you know, if you've got if you've got a child who is grandchildren who are really young, who takes care of that. If you've got kids who may have a problem, whether there's a divorce issue or legal issues, or they got a disability, how do you take care of that? We just talked about a whole variety of issues involving your kids and your grandkids, or if you don't have any, whoever it is that you're going to leave property to after you die. So if you get any questions about any of that, this is a great seminar to watch. With me, my good friend Janice Long is going to tell you a little bit about what is going on at the Senior Center, always a happy place. We were just <laughs> talking about that, uh, but I won't do my Munchkin song. Always a happy place. Um, Janice, what is going on in October in Hudson at the, at the uh, Senior Center? Well, the big thing, um, and hi, Arthur, the big thing um, in October is obviously Medicare open enrollment starts October 15th. Um, we have three full-time shine counselors here in Hudson. So this is the perfect time to check out your prescription drug plan, your health plan, and make sure it's still good for next year. Things change, as we know. Drug prices change. So we can do it over the phone, or you could come in and visit us. You can. That's what we're here for. Um, the Hudson Senior Center is getting ready for their fall fair, which is going to be Saturday, November 4th. All kinds of raffles and quilts and all kinds of things is going to be here. So we want to put that on the calendar. We've got um, a couple of new fitness programs you can see in our newsletter. And we have a fall prevention program in October with um, um, Kevin Flaherty, physical therapist. So those are just a couple of things. There's and obviously million. we have our daybreak program every Thursday. Which is terrific. social day program. Which is terrific. Mm -hmm. Janice, there's always stuff going on. So for people, for the, the, the remaining... There's still a lot people who don't haven't discovered you yet, you know, so if, if they've got any or they have, but they just, you know, have lost touch. If they want to talk to you about any of these programs, what's the best number to call? 978-568-9638. And you got to stop by. It's just a happy place. Just to it go is a happy see, place. Just feeling like you need some happiness. Just go see them. They're going to come back happy. And so if you got any questions on the seminar, give me a call. 508 uh, um, 860-1470 is my direct line. Thank you very much. Janice, have a great October. You and, too. And all of you folks too. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Hi, and uh, welcome to uh, episode 10 or seminar number 10 in the Elder Law 101 series that I've been doing since uh, January. My name is Art Bergeron. I'm an Elder Law attorney at Myrick O'Connell. Um, the goal of these seminars has been to combine in one set of or series of 12 seminars kind of everything I know and everything I think that you need to know uh, as a senior, as you get older in terms of dealing with your own life and um, regarding your estate plan after you die. So uh, just to kind of ref refresh you for a second, this is, this is seminar number 10. Um, right at the beginning, we talked about uh, dealing, with your dealing with issues when you were under 60. We talked about a number of issues. We talked about issues that were special to you in, if you're in your 60s. So if you are in your 60s now, you should really watch that one. Uh, things like dealing with, um, now that you've started, you've got tax deferred money that you now can take out without a penalty. You got social security, you got a bunch of issues. Dealing with your 70s, uh, when you're starting to think about, you know, maybe what, uh, thinking about whether you want, need to change the place where you live, you want to be thinking ahead about it, whether, we, whether you're ever going to need um, mass health later on. Dealing, um, we, we talked specifically about taxes um, because it was April and on the fourth episode. Then we talked about life in your 80s. We spent time talking about why you can always qualify for mass health, probably one of the most common issues that I talk to folks about. We talked about the last year of your life, which no one wants to talk about, which is probably one of the most important um, um, uh, seminars that you can watch. Uh, we talked about what happens after you die and what needs to happen, the post-mortem to-do list. Uh, we talked about trust administration um, last month. And then uh, for this episode, we are talking about what you probably thought that you came to your lawyer to talk about in the first place, um, which is kind of what is your basic estate plan specifically 
Uh, it's all about the kids and the grandkids. Um, later, we're going to talk about Medicare uh, in November because that's when it's Medicare uh, you know, enrollment time. And then we're going to talk about uh, give, uh, plan giving or giving as well as tax planning in December. So we are always talking about my friends Peter, or Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Um, we're talking about them typically when we're talking about estate planning. Um, we're assuming that the basic estate plan is that if one of them dies, all of the assets go to the other. For purposes of this presentation, we're assuming that Frank's dead. Um, and therefore, the planning that we need to do really is about what happens after Mary dies, before or after Mary dies. We're assuming that they have a house, which is worth about $400,000, that they've got a cottage someplace that's worth another $400,000, that Mary has an IRA worth, or worth $300,000, They've, that she's got savings worth 200, their total assets are a million three. Obviously, your situation is not going to be just like hers. Um, so you're going to, to really kind of focus on your situation, the underlying subtext here is you need to talk to a lawyer. You need to talk to a lawyer, talk to them about your situation, what is unique about it, and how to handle your asset, your own asset situation. Um, first, before we talk about the, way, the ways, the issues that you might, or the problems that you might have and the way you, ways you might want to get around them. I'm going to talk about the basic. What happens if Mary, who had the assets that I just went through, died and had no will? Well, um, regarding her, um, her IRA, she would have needed to name a death beneficiary or she would have been asked to name a death beneficiary. Well, what if she didn't? What if these assets, uh, she just died and left no will and all of these assets were passing through her estate? What would happen in that case uh, is that the assets would get divided equally. And so if Mary's basic estate plan is that when she dies, she wants everything to be divided equally, that's what's going to happen anyway, whether she has a will or not. Now, if there are children, uh, if, there, if any one of her children has predeceased her, then under current law, that, that child's children would receive that predeceased child's share. Inst interestingly, by the way, there is this kind of bizarre part about the current law that if two of her children had predeceased her, say uh, Peter predeceases her leaving three kids and Paul predeceases her leaving two kids so that there were a total of five grandchildren, the way that the assets would get divided would be that Peter's and Paul's shares would be combined and then the assets would be divided by five. It is not that Peter's share would be divided by three and Paul's share would be divided by two. So everybody would end up getting, that's a bizarre little piece of the law uh, if there is no will and therefore if, you ha if, if your goal is to make sure that if any one of your children has predeceased you, that child's share goes to that child's children, you want to have that, you need to have, handle that through a will. Um, if any of the children were under 18 and there were no will, uh, then that child's share would end up getting held in an account that the probate court would order be created. Uh, the, that, that person under 18 would have a guardian uh, and that guardian would have access to those funds and at the time that that child was age 18, the child would get all the funds. Not another reason why in many cases you don't want to be uh, relying on um, uh, dying without a will and using the system because in that situation, you, you, if you've got a, any kind of significant amount of assets, you're going to end up with an 18-year-old getting a lot of money at some point. Maybe not the best idea. Uh, if there are no children, uh, then um, in Mary's assets would be divided among her siblings. If, as is, as is not uncommon, uh, her siblings have died, uh, those assets, each of that, each sibling's children would receive the share that would have gone to that sibling, et cetera, et cetera. So the point is, there is always a system and the assets are always going to get divided among, typically among family members if you die without a will. It is inconceivable to me that those assets would end up going to the state. Oftentimes people will say, I need a will because otherwise the assets will go to the state. No, if there is money, I've been doing this for 43 years and I can tell you, if there's money, there will always be a cousin. There will always be somebody who will show up looking for that money. So the question only is, when you die, is that who you want to have get the money? These cousins that you've never heard of, uh, as opposed to uh, leaving the money someplace else. So that's the kind of the basic system. So in terms of what, what Mary would be, want to be dealing with, if, her ba her, if, if all other things being equal, she would simply want her assets to be divided equally among the three kids. 
um, is, well, what if one of those kids has problems? By the way, one of the other issues that comes up is, of course, if Mary does want the assets to be divided unequally among the three kids, then for sure she needs a will or some mechanism to make sure that she is not going to end up dying and having these assets passed through intestate where there's no will and therefore getting divided equally among the kids. But what if, for example, you've got that daughter-in-law that you never liked in the first place and that really isn't getting along very well with your son and you're just not sure. You're just not sure if in the long run that marriage is going to last. So the question is, what can you do about that? Now the most common answer, it is assumed, uh, is to have the share that would have gone to Peter in that case go into trust for Peter's benefit. But there are a couple of caveats to that. I just want you to be clear on them. Um, first of all, uh, the, the law in Massachusetts, and this varies by state, so, so a piece of your decision regarding how to deal with this would relate to where your son lives, in what state your son lives. And I know this sounds like it's pretty granular, but you, 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 this could really change your estate planning if your son or your daughter is in a, in, a, in a, depending on what state they're in. In Massachusetts, if your, uh, da if your daughter-in-law divorced your son, and the question was how the assets would be divided up, in general, um, the, the so-called um, marital estate, the estate that's going to be getting divided up by the uh, probate judge, uh, would consist simply of the assets that were owned by one or both of them, and the assumption would be, in general, that other assets would not get, um, get considered. However, um, there is an assumption in Massachusetts that the division of assets needs to be equitable, not necessarily equal. So if um, you died and left a lot of money um, to uh, Peter, or even in trust for Peter, um, the court could consider whether as a result of that, um, those funds that are in trust for him, uh, his basic situation is such that he's, he's going to be otherwise well off enough that he doesn't deserve to get 50% of the assets. Maybe he's only, now they, the judge would never say, well, he's not going to get any of the assets. But the judge might say he's only going to get 45 or 40% of the assets, depending on how that trust is worded. And depending especially on what his access is to those assets, whether he has real, whether those assets are really as accessible to him. Whether it's in trust or not is an issue, but the real question is accessibility. So when you're thinking about those issues and you're worried that there might be a contest, especially if there's quite a bit of money involved, right, then what you may want to think about is who should be the best, who would be the best trustee for Peter's benefit? Would it really be a sibling, right? Or would it, better, would it be better if it were a professional trustee so that the court were saying, well, you know, this, it, it, it isn't like this is all a sham and your brother's got all the money and he's just going to give it to you after the divorce, right? If, if, so the question is, should there be a professional trustee? Should there be some limits on the amount of the distribution? If the court's issue is, are the distribution, is the division of assets equitable, then that's going to be affected by whether Peter or the trustee has the discretion to give Peter a million dollars out of the million dollars that is being held for him right, in trust versus $100,000 or versus so much per year. So you could put those kinds of limitations, thereby reducing the chance that a judge is going to say, using that doctrine of equitable, not equal, um, that the existence of those funds, even in trust, are going to affect how the assets get divided. Finally. Another kind of easier solution is simply give Peter's uh, share to the grandchildren or specify that if Peter, if at the time of your death, Peter is, Peter is going through a divorce, that the assets in that case would go directly to the grandchildren or in trust for the benefit of the grandchildren. Now in that situation, you probably don't want to name Peter as the trustee of that trust. You would probably want to name one of your other children, the, the aunt or the uncle, Paul or Mary Jr., as the trustee of that trust. So the point is, if that issue is of concern to you, then you really need to spend some time figuring out how to, how to um, best insulate the money that you are going to really want to be leaving to Peter and, and probably to the grandchildren in the event that that situation occurs. How about disability? Let's say that Paul has a disability of some kind 
uh, and, and her, his mother is trying to make sure that the assets that she is get, leaving him as a result of her death do not uh, inadvertently cause him to be disqualified for some government benefits and the disqualification may en end up costing him more than the assets that Mary was giving him would have benefited him. Benefited him. So the, the question to ask yourself in that case, and it might really involve having a conversation with your child, is what, what, what is his situation? What is the nature of his disability? And what kind of government programs are, is he on? For example, if he's on SSDI, Social Security Disability Income, because he showed to the Social Security Administration uh, that first of all, he had worked enough quarters to be eligible for SSDI, and secondly, that he's totally and permanently disabled so that he cannot get substantial gainful employment for the rest of his life. If that's his situation, then his, his Social Security check, the SSDI check, would not be affected at all by other income that he had or other assets that he had. So you could leave him a million dollars and he would still get the exact same Social Security disability check. You could leave a trust fund for him that was paying him $10,000 a month. It would not affect his Social Security disability check. The only thing that would affect his SSDI monthly payment would be if he were working himself and deriving so-called earned income. Then that earned income would be, could very well affect whether his SSDI checks continued. <clears throat> if, on the other hand, uh, P or Paul is on mass health, or you're concerned that Paul might end up needing mass health in the future, well, that's a program that is asset sensitive, that he would not be eligible for uh, if, he were, if he had a substantial amount of assets, and that if he is younger, he would not be eligible for if, he was, if his income was higher than certain income criteria. So in that situation, you may very well want to make sure that assets that would have gone to Paul are going to go and trust for his benefit. You, could, you probably would just want to name Peter or, or, or Mary Jr. You could name a relative as a trustee. Um, if, if, he is getting, if he is on SSI, and people constantly confuse SSI, Supplemental Security Income, with, with Social Security Disability Income. Two completely different programs meant to do two different things and, and therefore having two different sets of regulations. SSDI, Social Security Disability Income, is, as I mentioned, meant to take care of somebody who was gainfully employed, worked enough quarters to, to, as to be otherwise eligible, just like he'd need to have worked enough quarters to be eligible for Social Security when he retires, but then demonstrates that because of accident or sickness, he is totally and permanently disabled. SSI, Supplemental Security Income, is available to anyone who can demonstrate that they are poor. Uh, and poor, there is a very low bar to your, what the income is that you can have in order to demonstrate that you are really poor. Because the point of the SSI check, the Supplemental Security Income check, is to supplement your income up to that amount, up to that poverty amount. But that poverty amount for a single person in Massachusetts is going to be about $900 a month. So it's a very, very low number. So, so if, you're, if your child is on SSI, it, it, then any other income that he receives is, is basically counted against him because the point of the SSI check is to take the amount of income that he has and supplement his income up to this magic number of say $900 a month. So if he was actually, if you actually left him trust money in which he was guaranteed a check of so much per month, that money is going to get subtracted dollar for dollar from the, from the amount that he's going to get on SSI. So you want to be really careful about that. Typically, uh, in that case, you would create a so-called supplemental needs trust uh, that would specify that the whole point of the trust is just to supplement his needs. SSI also has some specific criteria that you cannot have that trust paying for his food, clothing, or shelter. Um, because the, the assumption is that if he's got, if that, that was the point of the SSI check in the first place. So you want to be really careful if your son is on SSI or your son or your daughter, or if you think that later on they may need to qualify for mass health. And finally, um, as I mentioned, um, you, you need to deal with this housing issue. Um, you, you also probably, because this could last for a long time while Paul is alive, uh, you probably want to name a successor trustee 
uh, in the event that the initial trustee that you name no longer can serve because this could go for a long time, you also want to deal with final distributions in this case. Where's the rest of the money going to go uh, after Paul dies? Finally, let's say that Mary does not have a disability, <clears throat> doesn't have a spouse who's a problem, but has some kind of problem. Uh, whether it is just that she just isn't great with money and she's got a ton of creditors, maybe one of those creditors is the IRS, right? The kind of the worst creditor to have. Um, maybe she's got a job in which there is significant potential liability. I always think about nurses. Uh, the liability derived from a job is typically derived from a job in which you can be accused of hurting somebody and therefore causing them pain and suffering because there is kind of no limit to the amount of money that can be awarded to, to somebody, an aggrieved person for pain and suffering. Nurses are just you know, prime candidates for that kind of suit. Nurses, doctors, anybody that is in a profession where they're actually touching people, right? So it may be that that's your concern, or it may be just con a concern that, you know, you, she's, you're concerned about kind of protecting Mary from herself. Maybe she's got a drug problem. Maybe she's got any number of other, maybe, maybe you're not crazy about the guys that she's hanging around with. If for any number of reasons, you may want to put some controls on those funds. In that case, once again, uh, your question is going to be, you know, is a sibling appropriate? It has been my um, experience, and once again, I've done a lot of this kind of work, it has been my experience that in those cases, often another sibling is not the best person. Because typically, if Mary's got some issues, Mary has also got some issues with those other siblings. And there is, there, there, there in many cases, there is bad blood. So your ideal um, trustee is often a third party. Now, in these situations, it's often hard to find a person who's going to be the trustee because if Mary's got issues, they don't want to deal with Mary. So that may be a real problem. I mean, there are some cases where people will actually name a lawyer to be the trustee. Lawyers are an incredibly expensive trustees. So you really want to only name the lawyer as the last resort, right? But if, if nobody else is there to do it, or if, if Mary is a litigious kind of person, so you think she may be threatening suit all the time, in that case, the lawyer may be the ideal trustee. Once again, in that situation, you want to deal with, you know, where is the money ultimately going to go? What is the final distribution after Mary dies? Because there could very well be money left there after she dies. Uh, then there are the grandchildren. And there's also often a lot of discussion about, well, you know, I really want to leave some money to the grandchildren. I want to pay for their college education. I want to do a lot of stuff for them. Well, remember, first of all, if, you're, if your goal is to pay for their college education, remember that by leaving them a big chunk of money, even if it is in trust for their benefit, and even if that trust specifies that that money can't be paid to them until they are above a particular age, like college age, above 22, even in those cases, um, that the existence of those funds is going to get, need to get reported on the so-called FAFSA, on the form that, that the, uh, that the um, federal government would use or, or requires it in many public institutions. And it, it, the, those funds are typically also reportable on any other private college uh, forms. And it has been my experience, although this obviously varies from school to school, that typically when colleges are evaluating the availability of scholarship or uh, loan funds to a student, if they determine that the student has funds or has access to funds or will have eventual access to funds, they will often subtract those funds dollar, from dollar, dollar for dollar from the amount that they're willing to give the student in student aid. So as I tell people, you, know, you, you may find that you thought you were funding, you were giving money to your grandchild, but you're really giving it to Harvard because they ended up shrinking the, uh, the aid package they would have given because of all of that. So it, it may be that you want to do that. Uh, you can also certainly um, put money into so-called 529 plans. Those are the plans, um, and there are, there, are other, there are other kinds of plans that are like 529 plans and, and that are kind of specific to certain uh, industries. Um, basically, the concept of a 529 plan is that you're putting money into an account uh, you are, the, 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 the income that is being earned on that money is not getting taxed while the money is in there. And as long as the money ultimately ends up getting used to pay for that child's education, uh, the money ends up never getting taxed. Uh, however, it, the, the person who has that 529 account or, it, or a like account can always get the money back 
The issue is that, of course, if they take the money back, at the time they get the money back, the income that has accrued from the interest or dividends or whatever, at that point there's going to be a tax on that income. The other thing about these, the 529 plans is, you, is that people should be aware for, so many, among seniors, for mass health asset protection purposes, uh, even if the money is in a 529 plan for your grandchildren, because you have the ability to get it back, uh, if you later need to qualify for mass health and there is money in there for mass health purposes, that money is still yours. You have to cash it in, pay the tax, and, need, and spend it down on nursing home care before you can qualify for mass health. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the questions regarding any of those issues is if, your ch if one of your children has died and you've got money that is going to the grandchildren, who's the trustee managing the money for the benefit of the grandchildren? We would typically recommend that you sh that shouldn't be a spouse, right? Because we've had situations. Now, once again, you, you know your family situation. We don't, right? Lawyers don't. But we certainly had situations where someone dies, a younger person, and the spouse remarries, and suddenly finds himself or herself having, uh, raising the, the original children, your grandchildren, and raising these other children and then having trust money available for some and not for others. And that's just not a good situation to put that spouse in. So, in, so typically we advise that if, if, if you're concerned that a, if a spouse, if a child dies, where does the money go? Typically we recommend that another one of your children be named as the trustee for the benefit of the, um, of the grandchildren. Finally, there are all of these um, considerations regarding how to deal with this. What's the best vehicle for doing all of this stuff? Well, certainly there's a will. And then if you've got any of these issues regarding a particular child, that will could contain any of the trust provisions that we talked about. There is joint ownership of assets, um, or there's, there's, there is a provision that you could put regarding many of Mary's bank accounts and things where when she dies, the children simply receive the money. Or there's a revocable and amendable trust. Each of these has pluses and minuses, certainly the easiest is to simply put assets in joint names with your kids or to name your kids as the death beneficiaries. Uh, if, if the assets are in joint names with Peter, uh, for example, then uh, um, at the moment of Mary's death, Peter gets all the assets. No, nothing goes through probate. It's very easy. Bad news is that if uh, Peter ends up to be not as nice a guy as, as uh, Mary had hoped, uh, Peter can just grab that money at any time because he's the joint owner. It may be not the right answer. The second solution is often to have a will that's a, that was, is traditionally a common solution through which you can divide up all the assets, do all the things that we just talked about. The only problem with, with owning assets at the time you die is that if you they're being distributed through a will, just like if they're being distributed through intestacy, before assets can be distributed, creditors have to get paid. In Massachusetts, creditors have one year from day of death to file a claim against the probated state, which means that assets don't get distributed for at least a year. Then, of course, there were the legal fees of going through the probate process, and it's an easier form to have arguments. The final choice, therefore, uh, and the choice that many seniors will, will adopt, uh, if this is their only issue is the, in, in their estate planning, is making sure that things are distributed correctly after they die, and they're not worried about nursing homes and other issues, would be to have a revocable and amendable trust. Revocable means whatever Mary puts into the trust, she can take out. Amendable means she can change it any time while she's alive. She'd be the trustee, but she would name one of her kids as the successor trustee. And then the child immediately could, following Mary's death, uh, distribute all of the assets. Uh, I was going to talk a little bit about cottages, but I'm not because I'm um, looking at my clock and wanted to make sure that we covered all of the issues that are the basic issues that Mary needs to know about regarding these, the, uh, distributing assets to her kids and to her grandkids. I hope this was helpful for you. As I mentioned at the beginning, your situation is not necessarily Mary's. It may be similar, but it's never going to be exactly right, exactly the same. Really need to talk to a lawyer about making sure you get all of this right. Uh, thank you very much for watching, and I'll look forward to seeing you uh, in the next seminar episode next month. Thank you.